and I even put together some little slides for us. So I'm going to go ahead, 1104, I think let's go ahead and rock. And this is recorded. Um, it looks like we've got some attendees in. Andy, Dominique, Elaine, Graham, Gregory, Jen, Katie, Steffi. What's up, y'all? Thanks for joining us. Hope you have an outstanding week. Um, let's jump in here. So I put together... Uh, and I guess format, this is a discussion versus like a demo or a presentation of any kind, but I did spin up just some lightweight slides to get us rolling. Let me move this out of the way. Okay. And everybody can see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look at those headshots. Right? Handsome and, and beautiful. Awesome shots. Um, all right, cool. So here we go. Photography studio, client lifecycle, the agenda for today. And I thought that this would be kind of cool was to actually spin it as a life cycle. So we're going to kick off with some introductions. I'm so pumped to have the panelists that we have included. I was in leading up to this, I was like, wow, I was so excited to get them involved. I, I, I did my best to kind of grab folks from the, for the broader community and then they were all excited about participating. So I'm like super jazzed, but I don't want to <laughs> steal any thunder. So we'll go introductions and then we'll step right into like each component. I, I figured introductions, a quick conversation about like the client life cycle, uh, at, like one level of abstraction at, like what does the exact life cycle look like in the different components so we can start to put the puzzle together and get a little bit more specific. So then we'll jump in to each component. So pre-engagement stage, initial launch engagement and onboarding, service delivery and experience, post-service engagement retention, referrals and expansion, and then we'll wrap with some Q&A. Uh, and I think it's important to note too that I, I kept these in the spirit of every studio is unique and everybody has their own approach. I, I kept the kind of headline topics very vague. So pre-engagement stage, like a lot of folks could call that kind of initial inquiry and lead response, right? There's different ways and kind of flavors to, to uh, label the stages. So we wanted to kind of lead with that, that this is always going to be a, you know, kind of customized uh, approach to what fits your studio. But without that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, be quiet here and pass the mic. Let's just go top to bottom on my screen. Jeremy, what's up, my friend? Tell us who you are. Where are you located? Hey buddy, um, Let's scoop with your studio, all the good stuff. Yes. Yeah, so my name, so I'm in the studio now. I'm a commercial wedding and portrait photographer. My name is Jeremy Liu, uh, Jeremy Liu Photography. Keep it simple. And I'm based out of Reno, Nevada. Um, uh, it's close to Lake Tahoe. So Reno, Lake Tahoe, we are eight hours away from Vegas. So I'm closer to the Bay Area and that people ask us all the time how Vegas is. And I'm like, I have no idea. Um, I am best of Reno in two publications for the last like 16 years in a row. Um, and I only do about 40 weddings a year, but at a higher end. And then I spend most of my time doing commercial and portrait work. Um, my goal is people. My strong suit is people and personality. And um, I can do a landscape, but I feel like it's just better with the person in front of it. That's me. Good stuff. All right. Over to you, Angie. Uh, my name is Angie Nelson, and I am a wedding photographer here in Maui, Hawaii. Uh, I also own a company called Engaged on Maui, which I super utilize Pixify for. It's um, it's a company where we plan and photograph proposals. So we do around 200 proposals a year, um, helping people find the perfect spot to pop the question. I have a team of photographers that work for me, and um, it's a lot of fun. Oh, we do over here. And I guess just real quick, too all sending our, our thoughts and energy and prayers uh to matt we know it's a tough time for you mo over to you last but not least <laughs> i am maureen sullivan i'm based in massachusetts um i am also a photographer uh portraits and weddings but i'd say for the last 25 plus years i'm a systems person i teach uh business management solutions ips solutions and studio workflow to photographers all around the world Outstanding. And and forgive me, uh, with the inaugural webinar, uh, there, there comes uh, some reminding that there needs to be housekeeping and some other stuff. So uh, in terms of the format, so there's a Q&A uh, button. You should see it in, in kind of the Zoom navigation at the, at the bottom of the screen. So if you want to drop questions, our, our hope in terms of general structure was to uh, go after Q&A at the end. But if you want to submit a question, you can do it in Q&A, and I'll try to kind of field those in real time as we're navigating the conversation. But for sure, we'll get to those questions uh, by the time we wrap. You can raise your hand, but I don't really know what that does, <laughs> except for let us know that you're here hanging out. Um, so I think let's just anchor around uh, the Q&A and we'll rock through those. Okay, so client lifecycle. Um, 
And this is interesting. And, and obviously, you know, Pixify at its root, for those that are more familiar with software, it, it's kind of at the intersection of like a CRM, which is a customer relationship management. Salesforce is the big one. They kind of invented the category. And then you have kind of uh, some HR tech or some human capital management for certain studios in terms of how they manage their their staff, their personnel, et cetera. And then there's a little bit of like an accounting or uh, like at the enterprise level, it's an enterprise resource planning. So, okay, you know, what's my income look like or my invoices um, outstanding? You know, generally speaking, it, it kind of pulls together those three things. And what's interesting is that in terms of a, an overarching framework, the client lifecycle is a good way to kind of contemplate that. And in a lot of categories, uh, the client lifecycle has become a category to think about like, all right, how do you want to visually map your business and the operations and the things that you're focusing on? And then once you have that stood up, then you can start to think about the role. And there's kind of three ways to do anything, right? People, process, and technology. It's like, okay, let's start with a lead, right? And so, and then a lead comes in and how do you engage with that person? And then eventually you, you I guess, pr present yourself in a certain way and you contract to do business all the way through to post-production. So that's kind of what we're trying to, to think about here. And, and I think the thing with a life cycle is ideally it sets up to be a flywheel is what it should be. Like the client, you know, the photography studio flywheel because you want clients at the tail end to be super jazzed about you. It's like, hey, you, you shot our wedding. I know that you also do maternity and newborn photos. Cool, now our family is growing. Can you come do a portrait by the way? And you can kind of diversify into all these different things. And, and then the concept of a repeat customer becomes very interesting. Or on the other side is, is somebody who's just an evangelist that refers you to other studios, et cetera. So when it's done right, it's like this thing that goes faster and faster and faster and it's pretty cool. So just wanted to spit that out very quickly as like a point of departure. Is there anything that you all would like to add about the client life cycle? on the most like kind of macro perspective no i mean that was that was good that was detailed I don't... <laughs> that was really good <laughs> that was all right yeah. okay yeah. all right <laughs> i didn't be, i didn't practice that i did throw on my like yeah, that was good. My, bla my blazer here for a big day first webinar big day um okay so pre-engagement stage and I, i've asked the panelists to frame a lot of their responses around like we want you all the audience to get as much leverage from this conversation as possible. So it's mostly around like, hey, like power law, if you follow that, I want to know the 20% of stuff that's going to yield 80% of my results. So I've asked them to frame their contributions around the best practices. Like, hey, I did this thing and it made all the difference or pitfalls. I did this thing and it was awful and you should not do it. Um, so that's kind of how we'll navigate it. But I guess pre-engagement stage, some things to think about, and this is even before the client lifecycle, but like profiling your ideal client and understanding your market channels and, and, and digital surface area. So if I were to ask uh, Angie, like, do you have a definition of an ideal client, an ideal customer? Yes. So I'm going to be speaking mostly about engaged on Maui because that's what I'm really utilizing Pixify for because um, there's so many different uh, facets of my business. But for, for us, our ideal client, it's... Um, it can be men or women, though we are mostly working with men. Um, mostly men are reaching out to us for help when it comes to proposals. Um, so we have we have a demographic. Um, usually it's age uh, 20, 27 to 35 or so. Somebody who has never been to Maui before or they've only been one other time and they're unfamiliar with the area. And they need a local expert to help them find the right spot make the proposal epic and get some amazing shots. So their sweetie's going to love it. Awesome. Good stuff. And, and Mo, I guess what percentage of the folks that you interact with are, have a definition for an ideal client profile? Ideal um, I would say we're probably at the 80% mark. Okay. 80% mark. okay. mark. So, yeah. so, and Mo, for, for you, like, I guess, the studios that you work with, right? Yeah. If you put your con consulting hat on, what percentage of them, like as a point of departure, it's like, hey, tell me who, who your best client is. Like, how would you define that? I guess, are, are you finding that a lot of studios have done that thinking as like a real kind of point of departure? I think a lot of people actually struggle with that. I find at the point that I work with them, they're trying to identify, um, you know, uh, who they're going after. So, you know, percentage, maybe 50-50. Some people are trying to figure that out and then other people really have an idea of who they, they want to focus on. Um, it, it varies. Okay. Right. And I, and I, I would pivot this one because well, I think that's a very interesting point of departure period. Like when you start to think about a client life cycle, um, at least in the wide world of software, we spend yeah. a lot of time thinking because the old adage is if you market to everyone, you market to no one. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And so get grasping who your ideal customer is, is probably like the most productive exercise you can start with. And, and I think what's interesting too, is if you do have some systems in place, the data can tell you a pretty good story. So it's like, Hey, let's just look at, or you just try to reverse engineer your best client. Like you don't need to overthink it. It's like, Hey, we worked with this couple and they did. And this was what that dialogue looked like. And this was the pace of the conversation. And this is, you know, kind of the main touch points. And this was their feedback as I went, cool. Just start there and, and try to replicate that as many times as you can. Um, but Jeremy, on, I guess back to kind of the pre-engagement stage, like digital surface area is kind of an interesting headline here. So, and I, I imagine you have a definition or definitely a pretty tight grasp of your ideal customer. But when you start to think about like, all right, I know who my ideal customer is and I'm not even thinking about getting leads at this point. I'm not even thinking about sending proposals or any type of consultative interactions. Uh, what, what would you say are your main digital surface area, like your main channels for people to find you, for you to connect with your audience? Like, how do you think about the channels that you have working for you? Right. So, I mean, everything goes back to, so I use my website as a, um, as a landing page only, right? So uh, a main area where everybody can find me and get a hold of me, but I'm spending most of my time, um, YouTube, Instagram, I tried threads, it's not working, but like, I feel like YouTube and Instagram and Facebook are my key components. I actually started my business back when Facebook was just like, I don't want to say just starting, but back when you can post something and people would actually see it and they would interact with it because all of my clientele is theoretically referral based. I am not the cheapest photographer in our area. In fact, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm probably the most expensive photographer in my area. And I'm only doing a certain amount of weddings a year. 40 years is my goal or 40 weddings is my goal per year. So the people that I'm targeting are people that know my work already throughout the years or have seen me in action, whether it's at a wedding or a bridal fair or something, they know who I am. That's who I'm going for. So when I'm posting on social media, I'm posting more personal aspects of myself. I'm posting about my family, my kids, my life. I'll vlog a lot. And I'm not really focusing on my photography side of it because I feel like there's amazing photographers everywhere. And I don't want to compete with photographers on the photography side. I want to compete with them on the personality side because weddings are so personal that if you're going to bring me into your wedding, you're going to have to love me as a person because I am the ultimate guest, right? Our wedding photographer is the ultimate guest. We're with the bride more than the groom for that day. That's, I've never, th yeah, you better like whoever's going to show up and be like, yeah, totally attached to everybody during the, photo that's totally interesting insight. Um, cool. What I, I want to probably pause because we, I mean, obviously that's a huge Pandora's box to go down to in terms of like content creation, et cetera. Um, but one, obviously we're a big fan of frameworks and principles, uh, my crew. So one that has been really useful for us is like, don't, because a lot of times there's kind of like the art of the start with content. It's like, where, where do I start? What should I do? It's like, you know, just start with the channels that you're the most familiar with. And I would say definitely you need kind of a website as, as like the main magnet, the main kind of anchor to attach everything else in your world. Um, but our favorite adage is uh, don't think about creating content, just document what you're doing. And what's yeah. very interesting for photographers is that documentation is kind of baked into the work streams that you're already doing. So if you bring a little bit of a personal edge to it, it's like, hey, here are the images, obviously, with your clients opt in. Here are some of the images that we're capturing. Like this is the art, right? This is what we're trading in. But here's kind of behind the scenes of how we go about what we do how we approach clients, how we try to elevate the entire experience, how we try to be a huge asset on the day of, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, don't think about content, just start documenting what you're doing <laughs> and just pump it and pump it and then let the world tell you what's good and what's not great. Uh, but even then I would say, you know, listen to your heart and keep doing the fun stuff. But all right, so switching gears. Um, so pre-engagement is really just kind of a thought process around who's our ideal customer, where do they hang out and how today are they able to find us? Uh, simply put, right? So now if we change gears to uh, initial engagement and onboarding. So I would just say, and we'll just go around, um, so, or, uh, I don't want to steer you too much, but I'll just throw out a few things. So uh, the importance of first impressions, the data on first impressions is bananas. It's like we form our first impression in like a 30th of a second. And that lasts for months or it's like the amount of data that we need and interactions that we need with somebody to change that our first impression is like insane. So first impressions matter a lot. Um, and just some quick hacks. And I, and I guess the, the challenge here is, is uh, where you all use Pixify on a regular basis, but we probably don't want to go too, too technical because we can't really screen share and show the product. But if you could just speak conceptually about how you use tooling, period. And I don't want this to be totally biased to, to Pixify, but how you use stuff to accelerate your world throughout. So 
what do we think is the most important thing about initial engagement? And let's just start there because onboarding is a little bit of a different can of worms. I would say, oh, sorry, I, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call a call so that no, we can the avoid same that situation. My, I, I know better than that. Yeah, that's my bad. All right, I'll try to vary it up. So let's go, Jeremy, start with you. So I, I mean, honestly, the first thing for me is is the speed of replying, is getting right back right away, right? And and the way that I use Pixify is my questionnaire's built in, my email's going out. So as soon as that email comes in, I do, I do it differently. I manually send my questionnaires and my first email out rather than automated. Um, I just like that control. Um, so as soon as an email comes in or a notification from Facebook or Instagram or whatever, the first thing I do is I snag their email and I send it to them right away. All my information, questionnaire, info about my safe website and all that stuff. So I think the speed of it is is going to show that I'm available, I'm ready, and I'm, I'm willing to work rather than having to you know, wait for a photographer for two or three days to reply to anything. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I, it's interesting. I, I swear I didn't ask them to say any of this, but I was just doing some diligence around like data points uh, and kind of putting together some stuff to substantiate where I thought the conversation would go and uh, compete on speed is very interesting in service-based businesses, period. But 50%, I don't know, I can't remember what the source is, and you, like 80% of all stats are made up. So take this with a grain of salt, but 50% of buyers choose the vendor that responds first. So that's kind of interesting. And obviously that's a very automatable thing. Right, you you capture lead whether it's embedded in your website or you have an email workflow and you reply with a hey I heard from you, and I I, I guess Angie or or Mo and some of your your client or let's just go to Angie sorry <laughs> we'll then avoid that cup that issue again uh, like do you include anything in or assuming you subscribe to you want to be as responsive as humanly possible, and then I guess the knock on that is but you want to be a human. Yeah. So I, I guess, how do you approach humanizing that touch? And is it in your mind to kind of move the conversation forward? Like, do you include a questionnaire or is there any kind of intake in that first? And FAQs are very common as well, right? Like, hey, here's the stuff you're probably going to ask about. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. So we have email templates that my office manager can choose from to respond to an inquiry, whether based on location or what package that they're interested in. And that's part of the question, the um, contact form. So if they're interested in a helicopter proposal, for example, they get the helicopter templated email, and which is like, hey, go check out some of these other helicopter proposals that we've done and make sure that this fits your vision. Um, here's some more information for you. We give out a lot of um, free information to gain people's trust. Yes, we're local experts. Yes, we know what we're doing. We've been doing this a long time. And then the final step is um, scheduling a time to talk with our office manager. So we talk with everybody on the phone before we book them just to make sure that they're fitting the ideal client. We do after sales. So they only get a certain amount of digitals with their package and then everything else goes into an album. If they want to upgrade their album to get more digitals, they can do that. But it's really important that we talk to them and tell them these things over the phone before we book them. Um, because people don't read. <laughs> um, so we want to make sure that we're getting yes. them on the phone and talking with them about the process before we book them. So of course, speed of response is really, really important. Um, we are we are on it, but also giving them the information that is pertinent to exactly what it is that they're interested in. Perfect. So that's mapping kind of, or so, well, I guess bullet number one on the third webinar about elevated client experiences is this concept of segmenting your customers. Mm -hmm. So understanding they are of this profile, they are, are, have demonstrated intent for this package or however you want to think about it. And then you curate that entire experience, just like you mentioned, um, to, to what the profile is. So that's very cool. And I'm totally interested in a helicopter proposal. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds incredible. Um, cool. Mo, Mo any, any, anything to add to that? Like, I guess, what, what would you preach as your best practice advice around like this notion of lead capture and initial response? Um, I, I would just kind of echo what, what's already been said. It's just the automation and follow through, um, you know, just making sure, it, you know, you're following up customer service and then, you know, the way you brand all your messaging. So it's just that level of professionalism. Um, I've heard over and over from other photographers, how they hear from people when they do follow up that say they've reached out to 
X number of photographers and no one ever got back to them. So I think, you know, some of, and I agree, I don't love automated responses. I think they definitely serve a purpose though. And I think they're important, but figuring out in your workflow, um, you know, what messaging you want to kind of approve first so that you can personalize it before it, it sends. And then some of the things that you can automate just to take a little bit of that client correspondence off your plate, um, I think is is key. Totally. All right. And I think as, as Angie noted, like balancing qualification, right? Mm -hmm. Because time is our, is our most finite resource. So we want to make sure that uh, without, I guess, turning people away, that it's like, hey, here are kind of some table stakes criteria to, to work with us generally. And you've earned that right as a function of your body of work over years, right? And it's like, hey, just, you know, this is kind of the lane that we're in here. If that's cool, great. So there's kind of a balancing of qualifying thing, uh, opportunities, if you will, um, in a way that's efficient for you and, and efficient ultimately for the client so that you're not wasting time coordinating calls, jumping on the phone just to get to a non-starter right out of the gate. And then on the other side is like, being consultative, right? Giving away whatever information you can to, to build trust and, and I guess demonstrate that you are an expert in, in the category. Uh, so I think that's kind of the interesting thing that we try to balance um, in terms of automation is like we are including table stakes information that keeps the conversation moving forward and, is, and kind of signals mutually that next steps make sense adding value where you can, and then addressing some of the FAQs that are probably just on that couple, like if we're using the wedding use case here that are just on their mind generally, right? So it's like, how many shooters are involved? Will you provide a day of show timeline? You know, just stuff like that. What's the process look like? Because so much of the questions are around process, right? Like, how do we, how do we work with you? We've never done this, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's usually a first for most people. So cool. Uh, wow, we're like right on time. <laughs> this never, ever happens. So 1125. Moving to service delivery and experience. Um, well, and I guess, is there anything else? I feel like that this is such a big element. We maybe I should have allocated a little bit more time, but on the like onboarding. So I guess let's weave on that because I think initial engagement and onboarding kind of captures a lot, but I guess, so let's say general brass tacks workflow, a lead comes in, you send some kind of communication. Uh, you've both kind of mutually agreed that a next step makes sense. I guess, where do you typically go from there? Is there a, a phone consultation? Are you kind of prescribing a package based on their needs? What does that initial step look like? Are you directing them towards a booking page? Let's maybe just talk about that next step because it's a big leap to service delivery. Um, so Mo, what, what do you typically see from folks in terms of like, all right, you got the lead, they're generally qualified. You've sent them an automated react response. They've gone through your FAQs. Maybe you've directed them towards a booking page or you've suggested, hey, here are the typical packages that are best fit for your scenario and what you're hoping to achieve. What do you see as the best practice next step from there? Um, well, you had mentioned pre-qualifying kind of the lead. I definitely see a trend in people uh, going towards, um, you know, scheduling that consult right away, even through the website, maybe the lead contact form. If they have the lead contact form redirects to an online or just booking the online consultation with them. Um, and then, you know, it can kind of push information out automatically through the system through PixFi where it might email, you know, um, what to expect or FAQs or that sort of thing. But I see a lot of people weeding out maybe some people interested in photography if they don't, if they don't book that consultation, you know, so people that are just price shopping, because what that does is it, if, you're a one person show it creates now I know you guys have help in your studios which is great but some people I work with it you know they might be alone so doing that constant emailing back and forth to either schedule a time or get information out they just want to get straight to the consultation that's what I see people doing cool and that makes sense too and I think it's a thin line right between there's nothing more time vacuumy than this elaborate back and forth email. It's, <laughs> it's like, it. let's, just, like let's just talk for 10 minutes. Yeah, it's an know? absolute time suck. And, and what happens, I think what I've heard happening from those that have converted to that, where they just go straight to the consultation, their conversion rate is higher. Um, so they're not spending all that time going back and forth with the email correspondence. And again, those that do book, that do book the consultation tend to convert more so than the other leads. Cool. And I think this is a really good, I'm going to lift this desk back up so I can keep bringing the energy here. So the, uh, I think that's a really good thing too, is that like in business, I think there's kind of a, uh, a miscon or something that is subscribed to that I'm not sure is accurate that it's like, Hey, I'm going to map my client life cycle and then I'm going to move on. 
it's like, oh, this is a living dynamic thing. And if there isn't some rate of improvement over time, you probably need to look yourself in the mirror and be like, whoa, we haven't learned, like we haven't fine tuned anything in a while. Like that's a big signal that, that you might be moving off base. So to your point, it's like, Hey, let's try this for a while. Let's, mm -hmm. let's offer up a, a live consultation. We'll send them a link to a calendar and then let's, you know, let's do that for six weeks and, or let's try that this season and see what we get. And then you can look at it and measure, Hey, were our conversion rates better? Was our average contract value per wedding mm -hmm. better? Um, so it's this living dynamic thing that you want to evolve and that you want to tinker with. And I would say, definitely don't be afraid to experiment. Um, that's where the, half the fun is cool. Um, Jeremy, anything to add to that, my man? No, uh, so I am, um, same with Mo was saying, I'm a, I'm a one person band. So I'm that one person. I do everything myself. I have nobody else with me. Um, but yeah, I mean, the goal is, is, is eliminate the red flags through each process. And then once I eliminate once I feel like the questions are answered, they know my pricing They're I'm available. Um, they're not weird people. They're not just price shopping anymore. Um, once I get them on the phone or in person and I try to do both. I'm pretty much going to book them. Um, you know, nobody wants to waste their time. So that questionnaire that I send out the first time, um, like Angie said, if, if they, they, people don't read, so I send them the info and if they can't fill that and respond to it, that's just going to stay in my leads for a while. Um, and then I just remind them there's a questionnaire until I have the wedding date booked and I make them say no to me, um, which is annoying to them, but I'll send an email out every three days, reminding them to fill things out until they say, Jeremy, go away. I'm not interested. I don't want you. And then I'll be like, cool, we're done. Thanks so much. Um, but those are the price well, shoppers. That's, and that's the great OG sales advice too, is it's it's not the no's that kill you. It's the maybes. Yeah. So it's like, get yes or no and move on. Um, and I think also uh, engagement with communication is an interesting proxy for how qualified that lead is. Like how jazzed are they about working with you? It turns out they read every email. <laughs> That's like, cool. Yeah. That's probably going to be a better human that I want to work with that's dialed in and does the prep and does the stuff. And you show up and you, you know, just the likelihood for a really successful outcome is much better versus, you know, oh, I kind of read it. Sorry. And it's, you know, have redundant conversations, et cetera. Um, Angie, anything to, or I guess, do you have a different approach? Any, 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 ah, here we go. Any really hard lessons learned on the kind of next step after a, mostly qualified probably to toying with some type of live interaction so when i was training my office manager to take over because i was a i was a one-woman show for a really long time which got my system super dialed in but as we had more and more volume like i i could not keep up i still like doing my wedding photography i couldn't do both things at the same time so as i was training my office manager i had told her that the phone conversation is one of the most important parts of this process because it's not just explaining our services to the client, what it is that we offer and our process, which includes print sales, right? But it is also a way for us to look for the red flags. And we have, we have like a laundry list of red flag phrases <laughs> that, um, that people might say on the phone that can lead us to, Hey, I don't think we're a good fit for you. So, you know, people who want things like if, if they're, if their vision is all over the board and they can't commit to one thing like, Oh, I want a beach proposal. And then like the next day, Oh, you know what? The helicopter sounds cool. Ooh, can we put an arch on the beach? Just like things all over, but you can't put an arch on the beach by the way, but all of these things are red flags for us. In that, like, you don't have a vision, you're not sure exactly what you want, or if they're just increasingly more difficult to work with, it's okay to bless and release. I tell my, my um, office manager, because at the end, these clients that we bend over backward for typically are the ones who always have an issue afterward. Totally. So it is, we actually save money by not saying yes to them because the amount of admin on the backside to take care of people that are problematic like that is really expensive. Totally. And that's another like interesting kind of logical fallacy in business where it's like, I need as much business as humanly possible. It's like, eh, if you probably cut your 20%, like most 
troublesome most time intense customers you have to think about it from an opportunity cost perspective and it's like wow and this is back to kind of power law it's like what if we got rid or what if we were able to screen away our 20 percent most troublesome clients and that creates not only a, a window of opportunity to double down on the clients that are the best but there's a lot of different ways that you can allocate that time uh bless and release that's nice i like <laughs> that that's like bless you have a nice day it's like we're not a good fit and that's you know no is a superpower Cool. All right. Now I feel like we did that component a little more justice. Um, okay. So I guess now, so I think something that I hear a lot about, and I've, I've really committed over the last eight, like I'm just consuming as much content as humanly possible on photography studio, uh, operations, management, growth strategies, tactics, podcasts galore. And I think one thing that, that is very, and I guess just in general as a business kind of principle is, is delivering a consistently excellent experience. Because I think it's okay uh, to, or that's like the true mark of a champion, right? It's like, are you an all-star four or five years in a row? Like one year you had a great season, right? But it's, you know, can you tether those uh, experiences together for your clients over time? Um, so I guess when you think about service delivery and client experience, and I, and I, I want to be careful not to go too hard into like, uh, creative techniques or kind of equipment or more of like day of show execution, but when you think about delivering a consistent client experience, um, what are some of the pillars that kind of stand out in your mind? Well, let, let's start with with uh, with you, Angie. So making sure that every client gets the same information that's delivered within the same timeline. Mm. So when they book with us, so let's say they've had their consultation call, right? And we're a good match. Great. We send them, uh, we use proposals in Texify that has everything all laid out. So then that way it triggers the right workflow. Um, you know, let's say that they're, let's stick with the helicopter proposals because those are sexy. Let's say they're doing a helicopter proposal. As soon as they book with us and they put down their deposit, they get the proposal guide, which is going to tell them basically how to propose and not mess it up. <laughs> oh, God, I um, could have used one of those once upon a time. I mean, things <laughs> like make sure she gets her nails done, right? Um, here's a list of lies that you can tell her to get to the location or whatever it is. For a helicopter proposal, you don't have to lie because, oh, we're going on a helicopter tour. Uh, but for the beach, this is how you get them there. We, we, have, we have an entire uh, PDF that's going to prep them for the proposal moment. We ha also have a PDF that is like, here's great places to go to dinner or lunch afterward because you're going to be hungry and you just got engaged. Um, they get yeah, so that along with additional information depending on the package that they get. And I think having a roadmap of when they get this information during the process is really important and it makes for a good client experience across the board, whether they book tomorrow or somebody books six months down the line, um, getting them that information in a timely manner. So then that way it works with our, our workflow as a studio is really important. And of course, for the client experience too. That's so good. And the OG marketing principle for that one is right person, right message, right time. Yeah. And if you can nail the timing and the context is just totally relevant, then there's a better likelihood that they'll engage with it. It's like, hey, you're a few weeks out. You're probably getting a little nervous about how you're going to propose. Mm -hmm. Here you go. Um, cool. That was super thorough. So, Jeremy, maybe we, we, I guess, what do you do to make sure that you're on the same page with a client on the big day? Like, do you provide I mean, shoot yeah, brief, so day of show execution? Yeah, we, we create everything. So, I mean, I don't get the luxury of having a coordinator every wedding that I shoot. And I can't rely on the client to send me anything. So um, using Pixify, I actually send them a 50-question questionnaire um, about three months before the wedding. And that will give me a timeline for the day. And I end up running the show and somehow or another. I'm just type A about it. Um, but it's it's the Disney experience, right? So Disney, we love Disney. We go there all the time. But we... Everything we do for one client, we want to do for the next. So there's things that I do during a wedding that clients don't know about unless they've been to a wedding in the past. And it's also one of those things where if I don't do it, they'll know and then they'll call me out on it, which doesn't happen because I'm going to do it because I'm OCD and I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> but the day of the wedding, you know, and this goes like back to bartending and food serving. Also, if you've never served food before, you should go serve food for a little bit because 
you understand how to work with people. So being able to just anticipate their needs is the number one thing, right? I, I have an assistant every wedding who does not shoot. So I have a second shooter and an assistant. My assistant's job is to be an extra set of hands, an extra brain, an extra set of eyes. And if something needs to happen, we're doing it. Um, we're not going to ask questions. We're just going to make it happen. If the bride left the bouquet somewhere, my assistant's getting, we drive drunk people home. We do whatever we have to. My assistant gets paid well, but these are little things that like, Hey, I didn't know a photographer did that. Well, photographer doesn't do that, but this is your day. I'm not going to make you worry about certain things of your day. And then guess what? That goes back to the Yelp review that goes back to telling all the people about me and builds my future business because we're always marketing in some way or another. Totally. And it's interesting. That's super interesting response, right? Because I think you can also think about like, what are your pillars or your beats as a brand? Like, what are the three or four things that you do that you know that absolutely delight folks and you're religious about delivering on that? And then you start to build a reputation around that because brand is usually a function of consistency. Um, So that's interesting, like fixating on like, hey, what are the beats or what are the things that are differentiated to us that we provide every client and just making sure that you knock those down and then you deliver a consistent experience that way. Um, That's super interesting. Um, Cool. And then, and and sorry, Dominic, I've to ha- try to keep one eye on the Q&A. So we're going to backtrack just a little bit, but I th- this is interesting and I almost asked it as well. Um, we'll backtrack just a moment to what are, I think, red flags is kind of interesting. So I think uh, if we could just spend a few seconds, like what are some red flags, just to make that more real. So obviously one is like balking at price right out of the gate. Another red flag, and I wouldn't say this is a red flag, but non-starter is like scheduling and availability. Uh, lack of clear vision or kind of like maybe scattered like, oh, I want this and I want that and I want this and I want that and I want this. And, and sometimes that can be a function of curating your offering a little bit. So that might be like a menu thing. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that's the case for you, Angie, but a lot of times it's uh, a not like Chinese food menu, right? You look at it and it's like, oh, dear God, like, I don't know what I want. And then you try to smush stuff together. But I'll pause there. What are just to give the audience a little bit more uh, context? What are some red flags that you all look for in conversation or otherwise? Um, for for us, I mean, I already talked about some of our red flags, like lack of vision, because um, we do beach proposals and then people see beach proposals done in Mexico that are insane. But like we have we have a lot of regulations here when it comes to what you can and can't do on the beach. So a lot of times people just don't know and we'll clear it up with them. But if they keep coming back with more and new ideas, um, that can be a red flag for us. Also, people who are really, really last minute. So we have, we have actually have for like for beach proposals, we have two different workflows that go with these beach proposals. One is if they're booking two plus weeks out, because as I said, our majority of our clients are men and men tend to be a little more last minute than women. They're not quite the planners that women are. Um, we have a two plus week out you know, planning a proposal. And then we have one that they're planning it in less than two weeks. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say like 72 hours or something. Oh, like, we've, we've oh, done man. it before. <laughs> yeah, and totally. the people that we right, work with who are within 72 hours, we're literally like, we're jumping on the call. You need to book us, pay in full within two hours of the call. <laughs> yeah. And then we give them a very, very limited option of what they can do. And We'll have people either be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. You know, I just realized that she really wants a photographer and I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm so grateful. We have that. Those are green light people. Yes, we want to help you. They're just, they're just happy to be here. And then we have the, they want the moon and back within 72 hours. And then those are, we can't help you on this short of notice. So that's a red flag. So it also depends on their timeline for the event. Um, but of course, I know that our business model is very, very different from weddings, <laughs> where I, I feel like most of the time you're working with um, the bride, mm-hmm. who's, who's a little more on top of planning things. Totally. Jeremy, anything to add just in terms of reasons to say no? Because as, as you mentioned, you probably no, want to get I mean, to those my, as soon as humanly possible. Yeah, my two red flags are um, um, extremely lack of like, I don't know, like they take a lot of time to respond to anything. Um if I send an email out and they're not responding for like two weeks or a week and a half or something, and then emails keep going back and forth just to get basic information, that's, that's already a red flag in my mind. It's just, it's just not going to work. And then the other thing is, is bring up competitor pricing. Um, I am not, 
I don't care what Steve charges over here. This is my rates and what I do and why I do it. And I built my brand. This is what I do. So, um, and people do it all the time where they come in, they say, well, they're doing the same package over here, but they're doing it for 3000 less. Can you max, can you match that? Automatically my brain just shuts down and I'm like, you should book them because they're amazing. Cool. Those are my red flags. Yeah. And that's interesting because we think relatively, but not a lot that's relative in that field. Um, Cool. All right. We'll change. So we've got about 17 minutes left. So I think post-service engagement and retention, and, and this one, I think these ones blend together as well. But I, I think the the headline or post-service engagement and retention, and I guess these have been uh, distinguished versus referrals and expansion. And I feel like that, and again, like the uh, the fallacy in business is to think that, and I guess in, in a wedding photography context, it's like, hey, we booked the event. They paid us. Cool. The transaction's done. That's very misguided, right? And then to think like, hey, the show's over. We we shot the wedding. The, you know, the the sauce is, is done is also very misguided. That, that the, the orientation to a client should be that this relationship is never really over. But the, the peak of it is when we deliver, um, you know, the, the images that we've captured, et cetera. And we pair that ideally with a means to, to allow your clients to help you grow your business, because that's what the whole name of the game is. Right. And then we start to get into the flywheel. Um, but I guess on the topic of, of post-service engagement, do any of you send feedback surveys? Yeah. Good. Yep. Or I guess what are like the core tenets of your, hey, the, the shoot has, has occurred. You've you've kind of gone back and there's obviously a photo gallery hosting and a lot of different ways to really accelerate. Like uh, shoot, there's a ton um, and a lot of them play really nice with, with Pixify, but that's not necessarily our domain. So I don't want to go too much into like the feedback loop around images, nailing down, you know, the top images, uh, attaching kind of product sales and album sales and things like that. Cause obviously that's all very mission critical. Uh, but outside of those elements, when it comes to that initial follow-up, what are some of the kind of core tenants that, that you try to focus on? We can use one being a feedback survey, for example. So maybe let's, let's start there, Angie. Yep. So we send uh, a feedback email, just asking like, how did we do? Where can we improve for next time? Um, you know, what was your favorite part of this experience? Um, we do send that out to them. It It is interesting being in a destination locale because, man, I mean, like, man, I I wish, especially for my wedding business, man, I wish that we could just do word of mouth. Wouldn't that be amazing? But the chances of like a bride and a groom from Delaware coming to Maui to do their destination wedding and then they go back to Delaware and then one of their friends who's at the wedding is like, I'm going to do the same thing as you. Like, that's just, it, that's just not part of, I don't know. That's not part of our world here. So we rely a lot on, um, you know, feedback surveys. How can I be better? And then, you know, just pumping that good old SEO juice. Got to get that going. Like we rely a lot on um, internet feedback. So part of that feedback form, right? Let us know if we can help improve our process, but then also, hey, if you love your experience with us, please talk about it online. <laughs> Here totally. are all the places where you can review us. And, um, you know, if you share anything on Instagram, please tag us and we will repost it. That's an interesting loop there for sure. But I, uh, this brings up, like, and my hope is to kind of introduce as many kind of concepts as I can as we're growing is, uh, right, like at the end of the day, your channels boil down to owned, paid, and earned, right? Mm -hmm. And owned is your website, your social media handles, paid are the ads that you obviously pay for, and then earned is like word of mouth and reviews and things like that. And those are super compelling, especially if in a lot of uh, distribute distribution wise too. A lot of Pixify users are in, you guess it, destination wedding locales. Um, so it's it's about kind of creating a magnet for folks that have expressed intent. Hey, I want to get married in this location. Maybe I've been there before. And then how do I find um, the studio that's gonna you know be the best fit? Very cool, um, Jeremy. What about you, man? I guess and and how do you think? So I guess just to kind of speak to some of the stuff that you had touched on, Angie. Um, around time you're actually sorry let me let me get mo back in the mix here and i'm doing my best to get everybody in the mix here do it, <laughs> do like it. We, haven't, we, haven't, we haven't heard from you in a while but um like i guess in terms of just generally like so let's take a step back so 
like the the concept of like retention, nurturing, cross selling, referrals, building your business on the back of happy customers. What are some of the things that you suggest um, after that kind of the product's been delivered, so to speak? Um, well, in the, in setting photographers up on systems, whatever, you know, with PixPy or, or whatever management software they have implemented, um, definitely part of the workflow um, that comes up, the tasks of the follow-up, whether it's Google reviews or um, getting testimonials in an email format, as Angie mentioned, with um, direct questions that you're asking so you get the feedback you're looking for. Um, there's also photographers, I know that they like send out small gifts, like after a wedding or after a family shoot or something. So they have these steps as part of the workflow within their system to remind them to do these things. Um, and they're pretty effective. And they also, you know, also going on the front end where they track the source of the client. So they're tracking if they are paying, as you, you mentioned, anything that's paid or any channels that um, clients may be coming through, then they can run the reports in the system to see their ROI on different sources of clients. So they know what to do on the back end as well. You know, to get that's awesome. And, points and, and some stuff there. So that comes into like pure play kind of customer relationship management where it's like, you probably want to grab people's birthdays. You probably right. like trigger of like, what are the trigger events that occur? One is like the very obvious one is an anniversary. So how do you bring that in? And it's like, Oh, Hey, by the way, if you're planning to start a fan, and it depends totally on what you're, you're into. Um, Graduation but, year, birthday, anniversary, all of those. Yeah, certainly that's something you would track in, in PixPy as well that you can pull out. So, and trigger automated emails. And then that comes back to right person, right message, right time. Mm -hmm. Hey, former or you know client that's in kind of my my cohort or my universe. Happy anniversary! Here's something special that made you know that I help you. It makes your day more special. Yada yada, and then you can kind of build on the conversation from there. So that is is awesome. Um, okay, last. I'm trying to think if there's anything to add. Otherwise, um, we had, we had a question from Andy that that's. I think the red flags thing is a very interesting topic for for everyone. So I think maybe we'll we'll come back to that. Um, and I wish that there was a way to just kind of pivot away from like this panelist attendee structure, but I'm not sure that we can and just be able to see everybody because we've got a nice small intimate group here. Um, so I guess if you if we, we'll pause maybe for a few minutes, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A and we'll just try to spend the next 10 minutes just jamming through these. Um, but while folks are thinking about their questions um, for, for you, Mo, I guess, because I, I think obviously this comes back to time is the only thing that doesn't scale. Right. So getting very good at qualifying uh, and finding ideal fits, finding your ideal customer, reaching them, doing business with them is, is how everybody thrives. And that's always kind of the con like the discipline is to focus on your best customers, et cetera. Um, but what do you, uh, I guess, advise as red flags to look out for? Red flags and looking for, uh, gosh, I think Jeremy and Angie really pointed out the key things that have come up for me in the past too, is um, uh people who are just all over the place, like Angie mentioned, um, certainly price shopping is a huge flag for me. If someone's price shopping, quite frankly, I don't really want to work with them if it's really just about the price. Um, the other one is, uh, you know, with outside of weddings, family portraits, some other uh, portrait work, um, oftentimes just the, the vague, how they dismiss like, oh, I have to check with my spouse or I have to, you know, those kind of, they push you off type responses. Um, but I think if you have the follow through in place, you know, I often talk about with photographers, how, how many, how many, and Jeremy, you mentioned this too, you know, you'll keep following up, following up. And I, oftentimes it comes up, how many times do you follow up with the lead until you say, all right, enough's enough. Like they're, they're, I'm shutting that down. Like I'm, forever. I'm archive the lead forever. <laughs> You're just going to keep hitting them. Forever. <laughs> yeah, they need to, they need to tell me to go away otherwise yeah. you email me first you open the box like don't email me and then just stop responding well it's it's really interesting and, and jeremy i love that you pointed out the whole waiting tables i bring that up all the time especially if I'm, when i'm talking to, about ips sessions or doing sales sessions with your clients you have to learn to read people and i bartended and waited tables for like 15 plus years and i could not agree more man you learn how to read people when you do that and just understanding how to interact um, so it's, it's definitely, um, you know, when, when to cut them off, it's like, you can't, people will come back, right. You might, you might stop the contact after maybe six points or four points of contact with the lead. And then you just kind of back off and get, let it sit for a bit. And sometimes they come back and they're like, Oh, sorry, I was busy with X, Y, Z. And then they come back to you. Weddings different because there's a specific date in mind, but if you're talking like a portrait client, it might apply. 
and this is somewhat related, but funny. So I'll, I'll share it quick. I had a real estate uh, buddy and, and he was on a panel in a, in a conversation like this. And, and the topic was kind of around red flags, but it was like, like what are non-starters for how you pr uh, progress in a sales process? And he's like, if we're going on a showing, the wife must be there. Mm -hmm. He's like, I will not do real estate showings anymore without the wife present. Why? Because I end up going back <laughs> To mm -hmm. do the exact same showing with the wife, because the husband in, in most of those decisions can't act unilaterally. Like it's a family decision and you need to understand decision making. And I think there's some insight to be drawn there in, in our category where it's like, hey, how are you going about deciding this? Like, do you have criteria for a, a wedding photographer? Do you have a scorecard? You know, what's informed? And I guess obviously the more thorough and thoughtful that is, the more you can expect to accelerate that whole stuff. And that's like, all right, cool. This is premeditated. They've thought about what's meaningful to them. Cool. And away we go. Um, all right. Question from Graham for portrait studios. We don't use the client portal feature as we do all our selling in person after the session. Would there be any advantage to using this feature or would possibly uh, confuse customers more or create unnecessary steps? I guess let's start here. Jeremy, do you use client portals? In is that is that just where they create their portal? Like their all their information goes into one thing? Yep. So that's like, oh, yeah, I've. I've always used, I mean, it's, it's not, um, I, I used to do IPS before COVID all the time, hence the studio. But since then we just don't do it anymore because time, time waste. IPS meaning in, in person sales, right? Yeah. Sorry. In person sales. Um, I did make more money doing that in portraits though, but, um, yeah. So the client portal for me is really just a way to, to house my clients together. Cause my clients shoot with me annually, um, or a lot, like I'll shoot, you know, I, let's say I have a hospital that I shoot for, I do all their headshots here. Um, I'm able to track everything and put it all together. Um, but not all my clients actually check their portal. It's more for me, but they have access to check all their past invoices, past contracts, past everything. It's all built in there for them. Um, so I would uh, use it always. And as soon as I book a new client, they get that information on how to log in and their password. They can change their password, do all that stuff. Um, I think it's a bonus for a client, even if they shoot with you one time, but especially those that, that you want to track in the past, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's built in. I, why not? I would use it. Yeah. One, one quick thought on that and then we'll pass it over to you, Angie. And, and then we, we got a few really thoughtful questions um, from Dominic uh, and then uh, one from Andy as well. So here we'll, we'll get you up on these. Um, I, I've always like, there's a core distinction between like the actual feedback loop that is here are images. What is your feedback and let's curate it. And you can almost think of that as like an e-commerce engine, right? Where you want to kind of co-create a final product with your client and you want the feedback loop to be very, very tight on that. That's not Pixify. For Pixify, the client portal is, is, is purposed mostly towards avoiding those back and forth communications around like, hey, d uh, can you send me that invoice? Or God, did we sign the invoice? Or did you send us this thing? Did we do this thing? Did we do that? It's like, hey, here's everything right here in one place. And it's meant to circumvent a lot of those back and forth uh, conversations because if you're you know attaching stuff to emails, it's just asking for for stuff to get lost through the cracks because again everybody has day you know day jobs and they're trying to navigate through this stuff. So the client portal is meant to like drive traffic to one focal point for all the kind of artifacts and documentation that is involved with them as a client from like a commercial perspective. Anything to add to that, Angie? Or Mo? I would say for portraits, um, the portal is really handy depending on your workflow for portrait clients. But if you're managing the schedules, you think about the different just for your client to be able to log into one spot and see all their future appointments. So you'll have in a standard portrait workflow, you might have your consultation appointment, you have the shoot session, maybe you actually have a planning session in between the consultation and the shoot, then you have your IPS session. So a client could go into their portal and see all their appointments. Um, like Jeremy pointed out, they would see the invoicing history. So if you collect a session fee up front, not that you wanna remind them they paid that, but maybe you had a photo credit in there, a product credit in there that they would wanna see. And then if you do any type of payment schedule, um, you certainly could set up reminders, but they also could log in and see their payment schedule and pay things off as they want as well. So I think it definitely serves purpose and is helpful to your client if it fits in well to your existing or what you want your client portrait workflow to look like. I think so, so I think a couple of distinguishing factors, like maybe for like repeat customers, it makes a ton mm -hmm. of sense where there's like mm -hmm. a cumulative effect that happens over time, or if there's a lot of volume and product across different kind of cut, like, you know, corporate headshots, stuff like that. Um, all right, cool. Are you all cool to spend maybe two minutes longer than expected? So another like four minutes together all in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that all good? 
Okay. Make cool. it so you happen, buddy. Super thoughtful questions. Um, we'll start with a simple one. Uh, do you use booking pages? If so, and I'm doing my best right now to hold back because we've got some, for lack of a better way, sheer dopeness coming to the Pixify universe. And I'm so pumped about it, but it's going to be around booking pages to begin with because they need some love and they need to be way more beautiful. And that is coming and we're sprinting like maniacs. So that's the caveat. Do you guys use booking pages today? <laughs> and if so, how do you I, use I don't use booking pages specifically because um, of the custom nature of engaged on Maui. So we use custom proposals. Proposals, I was going to say, because that use case yeah. works. We, for, we it's like kind proposals. Of... And again, like, let's say that they're booking three days out. We don't want to give them the options of adding on a musician or adding on you know, um, orchid and an orchid flower circle on the beach because we can't order the orchids in time. So when we use the booking proposals, we can go in and for that specific client, we can remove different things. I don't want, I don't want to have a booking page that where they can just like willy nilly choose whatever. And then suddenly we're stuck scrambling. So for my model, using the proposals works better. So, and that's, I think, an interesting distinction, Andy, is, is uh, like you, the way I think about proposals is it's a contract, an invoice, and a calendar smushed together. And you can pull those things apart if you want, um, but a lot of it staff. depends. On, what's that? You can assign staff. That, yeah, totally. And you can pre-assign staff. Like you can for the advanced a studio options. like mine. Yeah, totally. So I would just think like, what's the use case for your booking page? If it's the case that you want to associate clients' intent with your calendar and use that as like a pre-qualification thing, like back to like, are we even available here? Um, there are some different ways to kind of navigate that without using booking pages entirely, but the most conventional use is like, Hey, express some general interest of what you're into and then knock like save the slot on the calendar. And it's mostly a function of, of scarcity on the calendar side for your studio. Um, mm -hmm. but it, the use cases are varied. Um, and a lot of folks will bolt that in with a proposal because it's like, Hey, our client life cycle, that first call is just a, a, a consultation after we have kind of that initial intake, we speak to them and then we send them a proposal that's lightly curated where it's like, Hey, we've got five options on the menu. We've trimmed it down to two or three. Here's some add-ons that are potentially relevant. Here's a contract and what that looks like. Here's an invoice. We want you to pay 10% upfront 20, you know, whatever. And then uh, obviously as a function of that, you've nailed down the time uh, as well. So anyway, hopefully uh, Jeremy you use booking pages. Oh, yeah. I don't. I don't. You know okay. what? Here's cool. the thing. I've been with Pixify for like, I want to say 10 years. I get a little 10 thing on the top of my name right here, which I figured out what that was eventually, like, like three years ago. Um, and I'm so old school with it that like, and I talk to you about this all the time, but there's so much stuff in there that like, I still want to learn and do that. I just need to hire somebody to kind of go through and, and walk with me. But like everything that I use Pixify for, I love and I'm just stuck in my ways. That's this old guy who's like, I'll be 40 in like a month, guys. So um, I, I'm just kind of stuck in it. And But the stuff that I use, I love and it works well for me. So like when the booking pages come up, I'm like, crap, like what is, am I going to learn about, like, do I need to go in and now modify everything? Which I might. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that even the Pixify group, I'm like, there's so much stuff that people are talking about that I want to learn. Um, but Angie said it best. It's like for her business, that's what she's using it for. And that's a cool thing. Like I use certain things for my business and I don't need certain things for my business, especially as a one person, one man band. Totally. But no, and the answer and is no. A, no, cool. And, I, and I, I think that's to be expected. Like, and I've got really good data on this. Um, that's like probably 40% of our uh, users use booking pages and some have different booking pages for different brands. Like you can kind of stratify that as much as you need. And and the, the staff personnel, it's either... I'm a one human show and I need to be very curated with my time or I have a big personnel bench of humans and I need to make sure that we're clear on what like their time, if we think about it from an inventory perspective, like what's our inventory and how are we filling that inventory accordingly and making sure that, you know, all the trains are on the right rails, et cetera. Um, cool. So some really good ones from Dominic. Um, and I'm, I want to be thoughtful of everyone's time here. Um, so what strategies or processes do you use to overcome staffing challenges? I think this is uh, an attract and train skilled professionals. I think this is mostly relevant for, for you, Angie. Um, but maybe here, let's see if there's one where everybody can speak. Best practices for forming collaborations. Or actually, I'm going to rattle these out. Pick one answer and let it rip. How's that sound? Cool. 
All right. What strategies and processes do you use to overcome staffing challenges, hiring photographers or videographers and, and uh, attract and train skilled professionals? So one is um, coordination. And then and let's just stick with that. Staffing coordination. How do you navigate that? Next one is best practices uh, for collaborating with wedding planners and venues. So this is more about partnership channels um, to grow your business. So staffing challenges, partnership channels to grow your business. And then this is a very good one. Reputation management. So when something maybe strangely goes off the rails and the review isn't what you thought it would be, um, how you tackle that. So real quick, staffing challenges, um, partnership channels, or managing not great reviews. Let her rip. All right. Staffing challenges. So yes, um, perfect. What we have a few qualifiers when we're looking to hire somebody, um, they need to have lived on Maui at least three years. So then that way they're familiar with things. They need to be integrated into the community as well. Uh, we don't want these turn and burn. I'm going to have a one year in paradise and then move back to the mainland after we put all this time and energy into them. So they need to live here for at least three years. Um, when it comes to actually scheduling them, they have a Google calendar that they share with us. Now I know that you can do this internally in Pixify, but this has just worked well for my team. We have a Google calendar that we make for them. We share it with them. They mark when they are unavailable. So if there is an open date, we are going to assume that that photographer is available. And then we will book them into, um, into the calendar. Our proposals stay open when we send out the proposal. That It stays open for 24 hours. So they have to book within 24 hours. Um, so then that way it's not like it's open for a week and then you know, our photographer got another job and, you know, then that's a whole mess. So um, that's how, that's how we do things. And then we have like a whole training protocol to train them to do things the way that engaged on Maui does them. Cool. Very solid. Uh, Jeremy, you work with any wedding venues? Yeah. So I'll take number dose. That's two in Spanish. Um, so I do a lot for my referral network. So before I shoot a wedding, I will email every single vendor that's part of that wedding and introduce myself, reintroduce myself and offer them wedding images. So, hey, if there's anything you need me shot that day, anything unique, let me know and I'll make sure you have it so that after the wedding, I can send that to them. Um, and when I send that to can them, I, I send that. So can I pause? So you basically give them marketing? I give them marketing for free. No Ooh. watermark, no logo, no nothing. And I do this- Smart because it's a referral base to me. And I just had this whole conversation with another photographer who's trying to charge a caterer for their photos from food at a wedding. And ultimately all of my referrals come in because of this. Also, I get to control hmm. the imagery that's going out to these vendors rather than assume my bride is gonna just give them parts of it or give them the whole gallery. Like I don't wanna give them the whole gallery. There's images I wanna send them that they can use for marketing that I want to be out there. And that'll come back to me. As far as venues and expanding my network and all that, venues and wedding coordinators specifically, I take them out to lunch. I send them a gift, uh, like a bottle of champagne, maybe a little photo book or something for the venue itself and a canvas, um, maybe a 20 by 30 or 30 by 40, something large that was shot at their venue that they can put on a wall. Ultimately, they can say, I coordinate this wedding. Let me tell you about it. Also, the photographer is Jeremy Liu. He's amazing. If you need his info, here it is. It's a referral without getting referrals. Um, and I do it for the venue per se, because coordinators tend to come in and out of venues a lot. So I'd rather work with the venue rather than the particular coordinator themselves. Um, even though the coordinator could be amazing and bounce from venue to venue, that's where I want my time effort to go. Um, so yeah, cool. it's really just about making sure that they are happy. They get professional imagery that they can refer you naturally. Awesome. Holy moly. Well, we better wrap it up. Unfortunately, again, like if everyone could speak, they would be clapping, but uh, Graham dropped the thing in the Q and A, like, thank you guys. This was great. So this was awesome. So I, when I speak for everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, Angie, Mo, you all absolutely rock. This was, uh, this is the inaugural run. So thank you for also participating in that with whatever, you know, kind of hiccups that come along with it. Um, one quick thing for, for if, if Gregory's still with us. So, and I guess this is just a message for, I guess, all of the, the Pixify community, but um, implementing certain stuff is, is or obviously there's a lot of functionality, right? And on the other side of the coin is like the implementation hurdles. And so we have, I've got the smartest people I know and myself thinking about this nonstop is like just 
curbing the the learning curve. And the number one thing is to improve UX and make it more intuitive. So we're going to address the root issue, which is a facelift of Tim, awesome software developer and also a photographer. So he understood the market. He was eating his own dog food, so to speak, uh, did not have a lot of user experience and user interface resources. So we're going to bring the best UX UI resources on the planet that are available to the equation. And we're going to start there. And then we're going to stand up uh, implementation videos. We're going to start doing workshops. So we'll base them on, and I'll, I'll summarize this quickly. We're going to start workshops that are based on outcome. So it's like, hey, you want to help lead uh, capturing and converting leads? Cool. You want help booking and coordinating events? And we'll have open workshops around that. And then we'll build content around that. Also going to be working with the ambassador community um, around video content production. Like what's the most effective way that you use Pixify to kind of unlock some of the secret sauce that's maybe not totally obvious about how to use Pixify, because obviously there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. Um, so a lot of good stuff that's going on that way. Gregory, if you want to shoot me an email, kajail at pixify.com about what would be the most interesting thing you could get help with right now, we'll put it to the top of the list. But I will wrap with that. Thank you all again. Um, oh, actually here, I even have, uh, so real quick, I'll just pull this up. Sorry, give me one second. Um, in closing here, um, so I wanted to recap this just a little bit because we covered a lot of ground. Um, so forgive me, I should have probably gotten to this a little bit earlier. But so here's, the, and this deck will come out with the video. But here is a very simple tactical breakdown of what you can do. And you all are seeing the life cycle one right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. I was like, oh God, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Never great. Um, okay, cool. So this is, and this will go out, but these are like tactically. And yes, they are of course biased to Pixify, but we included some other stuff here, but just like tactically, what can you think about little things to do at each stage of the life cycle? Um, what to expect from here? So the webinar recording, Zoom's gonna kick out an automated version. And then we're gonna turn this into a white paper summary and a loosely edited, I mean, from you all, if you edit the videos, it's not gonna be nearly as beautiful or awesome as the stuff that you do, but um, we'll, we'll edit this up and that'll be a recording that's gonna be hosted on our YouTube channel. And then we're gonna turn that into a white paper. And then the next webinar is gonna be loosely a month from today. So it's gonna be on the topic of workflow design, strategies and best practices. And we'll have some awesome uh, humans involved in that one as well. So I'll leave it at that. Everybody have an awesome rest of the day. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Cheers, Bye. cheers, cheers. Peace, peace, peace.